chapter today. I'm just going to zero in on this scripture in Joshua chapter 7. Look at verse 10 and 11. If you're a preacher, been a preacher, you'll know what I was doing. I was just kind of waiting on the Lord to prompt me. So I think we've got a direction. Joshua 7 verse 10. And the Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed things and have also stolen. They've assembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. In just a minute, we will give you some background to this story, but I want you to just use this as a handle on the cup of the message today. In keeping with our series on camping or camp meeting, today's title is, There is Sin in the Camp. Mm. Put your Bibles down and lift your hearts and your hands towards heaven, Jesus, today. God, everything that we are, And God, everything that we are not today, we put ourselves in your hands. God, you are the master potter and we are the clay. God, mold and shape and sculpt in us. Ah, Put us in the image that you see fit for us and that we might be a blessing to your name and to your people. And today, let every thought and preconceived notion be shattered. And God, out of the pieces, put together a life. God, that you covet and desire for each of us, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise today as you are seated. 30 seconds of review. uh, Week one of camp meeting month at the Pentecostal Smyrna. We remembered the account how the children of Israel had too much time on their hands. And they made golden calves and they began to worship. Because I want you to get this. You will worship something. You were created as instruments of worship. You may worship the one true God. Or you may worship a pro sports team. Or you may worship your children. Or you may worship your yard. But you're going to worship something. Their inappropriate worship calls God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smite them all. I'm going to clear the slate. I'm going to start over. But Moses took his tent and went outside the camp. And you know that he pitched his tent. And sitting there, he inquired. And that became known as the tent of meetings that God came and reconciled Israel back to him. Because Moses was brave to go camping for the Lord. Then we talked about... His tabernacle, that word is a temporary dwelling. The psalmist said in Psalms 48 that that tabernacle or that tent is beautiful for situations. And I want to remind some of you, if you're going through hell on earth, there's no better place to go than to meet with the Lord in his tabernacle. I don't care your situation. The church has still got the answer for what's wrong with our lives and our children and our jobs and our finances and our world. It's beautiful for situations. And then last week it seemed like I took a departure from camp meeting. But really it was about quality time with the father has a tremendous effect on the family. See as the father goes... So goes the family. Today, what was the zenith or the origin of the thought for today is I begin to reflect on camp meeting and tent services that the very nature of a tent or camping is a temporary abode. It's a non-permanent. Now, let, let me stop and plow there just a second. Show me in scripture, I don't think you'll find where God ever asked for a permanent temple. It was in David's heart. He said, it's not good that I live in a permanent, beautiful palace. What he was really saying is, I honor and reverence and respect the spirit of God. And it's not good 
for me to have a palace and him be in a tent. But God never asked for a temple. Well, preacher, that's the Old Testament. The Bible says in the New Testament that Jesus took three disciples to the Mount of Transfiguration and one Peter fell on his face and said, let us build a temple, a memorial here. And Jesus' glory began to depart because he said, that's not what I'm about. You want to hear what he's about? The Bible says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt means a temporary dwelling place. It's not paneled houses. It's not mausoleums. It's a temporary place of meeting that God became man. And for a season, a temporary arrangement, he didn't want to build a mausoleum on earth. But he said, if this temple be torn down, I'll resurrect it in three days. I'm going to. Here's what I want you to get. He said, I don't want a permanent place on earth. But he says, I'm going to go away and prepare a permanent place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. What am I telling you? God never wanted us to have a permanent mindset on earth. God wants us to have a permanent mindset on heaven. You can have the world if you want to, but I'm just a sojourner. I'm just a pilgrim on a journey. This world is not my home. It's just a passing through place. I'm going to a city without end where the lamb himself will be the light. The street will be of gold. The walls of jasper, the gate of pearl. I'm not living here. I'm living over yonder. See, we're just camping here. We're just passing through here. But Sister Sherry, we're going over there to forever. We're going over there. Forever. Today's text tells us the children of Israel were taking possession of God's promise. God had just miraculously given them a victory where they never had to fire a shot. The greatest adversary with a great wall city, the walls of Jericho fell simply out of worshiping obedience. If we would learn how to worship God obediently, there's no wall, there's no city, there's no stronghold, there's no issue, there's no addiction, there's no failure, there's no past that God can't take authority over and give you the victory. But he had a requirement. He said, don't take anything. He did allow them to take some precious metal to be used in the tabernacle in the future. But catch this. The very next city was the little city of Ai. That's found in our text today. Joshua surveyed the situation and said, hey, it's a small little community. Just take two or three thousand men. We should easily overtake them. But the word says when the two to three thousand men went against the little small village of Ai, they were so defeated. They turned their back to the enemy and ran. What? It was a shameful thing to turn and run on the battlefield. And 36 men of Israel died that day. What was the cause? In failure, Joshua inquired of the Lord. Can I stop and say, if he had asked the Lord before he sent the men to Ai, maybe the men of Ai wouldn't have had to die. Can I preach a little more there? And some people try to tell you that if it's wrong, God will tell me. No, God will let you do stupid if you want to do stupid. If you want to live life without inquiring of him and asking him in on your situation, he'll let you do it. But don't blame him for the outcome. If you don't invite him in, don't blame him for the outcome. God's answer was, there is sin in the camp. Somebody has broken the mandate. Somebody has breached the covenant that I'm going to go before you and I'm going to give you the victory and I'm going to drive out the Hibusites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the Termites. 
You don't believe it, but the word says that God even caused bees hornets to drive them out. They didn't have to lift a finger. Can I tell you, one day with the obedient favor of God is better than your best plan for your entire life. Do you understand what happens here? The whole nation was brought to a standstill because of one man's worldliness. For the word says that Achan looked and he saw and he coveted and he took some garments and some precious metals and took them back to his tent and buried them under them. It was because of one man's disobedience, his attraction for the things of the world that the nation was at a standstill and 36 innocent men died. Now, I'm afraid to say this today, but a lot of church people are unfamiliar with the term worldliness. It's kind of become lost in Christian circles. That even some would think worldliness is a good thing, man. We're cognizant of the world and we're monitoring our carbon footprint. Webster's Dictionary says worldliness is a devotion to the world and the pursuits of it rather than spiritual matters. Kevin DeYoung says it this way, worldliness is whatever makes sin look normal and righteousness look strange. I'm afraid many in the world today look at the admonition of righteousness as strange, but they celebrate sin. I won't call the church the denomination, but there is a church in our city that is flying an LGBTQZLM flag. And I'm closed minded. To suggest that there is a biblical code to live by. The same spirit that was moving on you during worship is still in this room right now. The words. The words. Are hard to come by sometime. The world says. You can love whoever you want to love. A man or a woman. God says. For a man to lay with a man or a woman with a woman, it's an abomination. That means God hates it, always has hated it, and always will hate it. He won't get woke. He won't worry about what Twitter's trending. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the thinking of the world says, but if you love something, how can it be bad? Because it's love. I'm afraid today, too many worship at the altar of feelings. I know I committed to stay together forever, but don't I deserve to be happy? You deserve to be obedient. Why should the rest of my life be hamstrung? I didn't plan this pregnancy. Abortion's an option. Abortion is not an option. Get off the altar of my feelings. The Bible says in the last days, men won't be able to handle the truth, but they will have itching ears. They want to hear what they want to hear, but let somebody call out worldliness, and they'll find another preacher to preach them happy because don't I deserve to be had. I'm by myself in here. But I love who I love, and it must be okay because it's love. If it were bad... Wouldn't we naturally not love it? How many good girls have been ruined by bad boys because they fell in love and thought they could change them? Emotions. The heart is the most deceiving thing 
our emotions will get us in trouble. How many youth have been educated to the hilt about drugs only to go out and become addicts? It's not good, but it happens. Let me just tell you a quick story. My home church, when I was a kid, we had a lady. Now, I can't tell you how old Bernice was, but I was a teenager, so anything over 40 was old. Looking young now. I was young. I'm now old. And Bernice, anybody know that Southern folk are famous for uh, smoked pork and homemade pies? I'm going to open me a restaurant called Pig and Pie. Come on, somebody. Mm. Bernice was the pie lady. She had a very hard upbringing, had about a third grade education, but she found what she could do. She did it with excellence. People would drive for hundreds of miles to get one of Bernice's coconut cream pies. Y'all was with me till I said that. She made a chocolate pie, lemon meringue pie. I, I, I mean, you could smother digging through the meringue trying to get to. The, it was good. Somewhere in the middle of her 30 plus year career as the pie lady at Gibson's Barbecue. She discovered she was diabetic. But she had to make pies to make a living. And she couldn't guarantee the quality if she didn't taste it. I saw poor Bernice lose a toe, lose a foot, lose a leg, lose another foot, lose a leg in a wheelchair, debilitated. She said, I know this sugar is killing me, but it just looks so good. But show my pastor. See, it was not good for her, but her love for it superseded what she knew was right to do. I texted Brother Brian last night. He'll reach out to me and say, hey, you got a sermon title for tomorrow. I gave him a different title for today. I almost titled the sermon as How Not to Die of Liberal Religion. Using lethal injection in capital punishment cases is a relatively new thing. Just a few short years ago, the Supreme Court discussed how executions must be carried out in a humane way. Now, we're not here today to discuss the merits of capital punishment, if you believe in it or don't believe in it. I'm here today to use the Supreme Court established you must execute a condemned, convicted person humanely. That is, the prison system must kill people kindly. If you're laughing. You can't hang or behead. You can't use the electric chair. You can't even use the gas chamber. And they wrote new codes of expectation of how someone to be executed considered to be humanely. you got to kill people kindly. I'm afraid that kind of thinking has crept into the church. Many saints are being killed with kindness instead of being challenged about their worldliness with biblically sound preaching. It's quiet. Now let me give you a disclaimer. Some preachers have gone to extremes. I know of a preacher, pastor, an influence in my life that God radically saved out of a life of gambling. He was a dice thrower. After several years of preaching, he began to preach to even touch a dice is a heaven or hell issue. Do I see how he got there? See how he got there. So you're telling me my grandbabies are going to hell for playing Monopoly. See, 
See, before I get on you, I got to correct me. Theme parks and ball games became a heaven or hell issue. The same guys that made looking at a TV a heaven or hell issue were all scrambling for live streaming during COVID. Can I say extreme? Do we all recognize now that it's not the device or the medium or the activity. It's the content and how we use it. The same hammer that can build a house can take a life. It's a hammer. It's what you do with it. Now, I'm, I'm already formulating here what's going to happen. I went to church this morning and pastor said we can do anything we want to and it's all good. Don't worry about it. Live like you want. If that's what you're hearing, you need to clear your ears out. You need to turn your smartphone off and you need to tune into the Holy Ghost. What we're talking about is that we need to not be extreme and add to the word of God and put burdens on people like the Pharisees did. Sometimes it's not what we do is the problem. They are just symptoms of the disease. I had a good friend recently that had a fever. He went to the doctor with further testing and examinations. He has been diagnosed with cancer. We got to quit treating the symptoms from the pulpit and we got to go to the source. See, fever can be cancer or a symptom of cancer, but it also can be a symptom of a cold. I don't want to treat the symptoms. I don't want to give a list of symptoms. I want to identify the source. And the source for a lot of the things that go against the will of God and the word of God for your life is not the action. It's the attitude. It's that worldliness that gravitates. Hey, I can go in the backyard with two gloves and me and my son can throw the baseball. I can even go down here to Smyrna Rotary Park and watch a soccer game. I can kick the ball better than most of you. It's not the game, but if it causes me to graft in my DNA a passion for that over a passion for the house of God and the word of God. and If I've got money... For sports leagues and travel ball. And I don't have money to put in my baby's hand to go to Sunday school. I've become worldly. I'm... Let's face it. That the world is affecting the church in too many ways. Let's go back to that lethal injection. I called it last night, Brian, I, I, I called it how not to die by liberal religion or liberal preaching. I'm afraid our enemy, the devil, is causing the pulpit to kill people kindly by withholding the word of God that brings healing, forgiveness, and salvation. We're killing people, but we're doing it nicely. Here it comes. Do you know that lethal injection uses three drugs? Three drugs. It's a cocktail of three drugs. The first one is a sedative. Once injected into the veins of the punished, within 20 to 30 seconds, they go into a deep sleep. Then the second drug is injected, and it's a neuromuscular relaxer. And it causes all the muscles, including the lungs, to be paralyzed. So after they're unconscious and unable to move, then sodium chloride in high doses is a poison. And it goes to the heart muscle and it causes the electrical impulses that cause the heart to beat to stop beating. Hear me. They died in a kind way. Satan is killing the church. He is seducing the church. 
He is causing us to get weary and well-doing. And we are sitting through services and we're saying amen because the person sitting next to us is saying amen. We stand up because the people in my rows standing up, but we're not engaging God. We're sleepwalking. We've become apathetic. We don't examine our own works. We're going along to get along. If it's easy, do it because I don't want to put forth any effort. I've been sedated with the seductive spirit of this world. You hear this preacher today. Somebody said to me recently, Pastor, you need to get them. Get them. I said, I am not your spiritual bat to club them over the head with. The Bible says, let a man or a woman examine him or herself. What I'm here for is when they look up out of their slumbery eyes and inquire of the Lord. I'm the person supposed to go this way. Go this way. I'm not going to wrap you on the head. If God would allow Achan and the children of Israel choose not to cry out to God before they go in battle. Who am I to insert myself if I've not been invited in? But Satan said to Eve, look. Forbidden fruit, doesn't it look good? You will not surely die. Be your own person. Be liberated. Make your own decisions. If it looks good, take it. Satan and our sleepy disposition has been able easily to manipulate and control us too long. Anybody know the weight of sin? That weight that tells you constantly you're not worthy. That weight that holds you back when you know you need to worship God, but you don't want to worship God. Why do you think pastor says when you want to come to church the least is when you need to come to church the most. When you want to run from the altar, you need to run to the altar. When you don't want to pray, you need to pray the hardest. I'm telling you. I'm afraid our enemy has paralyzed too many with the weight of sin. You want to lift your hands, but you can't. You want to lift your voice, but you can't. But I'm here today to tell you, shake off the devil. He's a defeated foe. God said you can be forgiven. If you confess your sins, he is sure and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. And then he first... Makes us sleepy. Second, paralyzes. Third, he kills our heart. Kills our heart. You can't feel anything. You see no hope and there's no way out. Well, pastor, you need to pray that God comes down and the spirit moves and an angel. The Bible says that God sent an angel to take Lot's wife by the hand and lead them out of Sodom. I want you to know that the angel of the Lord had her by the hand, but Sodom had her heart because she had set her affections on that worldly city. It destroyed her. Subsequently destroyed her daughters. Subsequently destroyed the name and the legacy of that family. It is a lie from the pits of hell to say what I do in the privacy of my own home is my own business. What you do in private, the gospel says, will be shouted from the rooftop. For no man can sin against God and get away with it. He's going to make sure you know. Could it be that you're suffering and struggling in spiritual matters because you have buried things in your home that you think nobody knows but God? God knows and he sees and he will stop you from receiving the promises of God. That angel had Lot's wife by the hand, but she disobeyed. She looked back because why it was in her heart. Her affection was on that city. It got a hold of her. How many of us think I can handle my disobedience? But I'm telling you what, it'll grow and it'll get stronger. Let me ask you a simple question today. What do you love? What do you love? Second question, where is that love leading you? Is what you love leading you towards the Lord or away from the Lord? Is what you're loving leading you to the house of the Lord or leading you back in the world? See, you don't have to overcome worldliness by saying, I'm going to be less worldly. How you overcome worldliness is, I'm going to become more Godly. 
There's no room in me for bitterness and envy and lust. For I am full of the Holy Ghost and fire. I have pushed all the cares of the world out and only made only made room for God. I give no place to the devil. Achan was led astray. The devil didn't make him do it, Geraldine. Achan was led astray by his own lust. Hear me today. Your flesh will get you in trouble. What you love will become what you serve. God had divinely delivered Israel from Egypt's bondage. God had miraculously given them the victory over Jericho without a loss of a life. But when they disobeyed, hey, catch this. I'm almost done. Catch this. The funny thing about Achan's loot, he didn't even get to enjoy it. He had to hide it, had to bury it, and couldn't tell nobody. About hey, what good is it to get a good deal on a garment at Goodwill and you can't tell nobody? I mean, if you can't share it and you have to hide it, it may not be good. Ripple effect. Let that soak in. Just a ripple effect. See, it didn't just affect Achan. It cost him his life. The Bible says he was stoned, he was burned, and then he was covered in stones. And his family. And the 36 innocent men of Israel. I guess what you do affects more than just you. Just like in Aiken's day, Jesus has delivered us from the world. Amen. You got to live in the world, but you can't be of the world. Right. Love not the world or the things in the world. Yeah. Christ died while you were yet sinners. We were just like Aiken. We wanted our cake and we wanted to eat it too. Yeah. And too many Christians today want to be saved but live like the world. Could it be you haven't seen the spiritual victories because you haven't overcome the worldliness that's in your heart? Third question. Is there something you wouldn't give up to save your own life? Think about that. Is there something? Oh, but I got to have that. I can't imagine a little bit. I can't let go of that. Oh, that, that's, that's mine. That's my private time. That's my hobby. That's my... Is there anything? Be careful saying yes. Because there should be nothing you're willing to not let go of to experience eternal life. I know this is radical, but Jesus says if your eye offend me, it's better to enter into heaven with no eyes as to miss heaven. If your hand keeps getting you in trouble, it's better. Oh, pastor, that's extreme. It is. It's a hyperbolic statement to make a point. There should be nothing in your life that you let lead you to hell for God died that you would not have to go to hell would you make his death in vain there's nothing I'm going to let cost me my soul nothing I'm going to let cost my family's soul hey guys today we may argue over there being a line see today is kind of a shadow conversation about how God does have expectations. There is a handbook and a code book for how you should dress and what words you should and shouldn't use and attitudes that in your heart and prejudice and biases. There's a code book. Well, that's the biggest employee's manual I've ever seen. This is not exactly what I'm talking about, but I want to use it as an example. There are some of you that would argue that a woman's skirt should be to her ankles and others would say she don't have to wear a skirt at all. <clears throat> we all would agree there's got to be a line. Ladies, if you ain't got nothing on, please don't come in here. Please. Please. We can go to blows over color of apparel and length of apparel and television and ball games and all these symptoms. Get it, symptoms. They're symptoms. But they're a result of what is in our heart. 
do, do, do you know what? I don't come home with perfume on my collar. Lipstick on my collar. I, I'm afraid of Julie. I'll just say it. <laughs> I'm afraid of Julie. <laughs> Cat fire. <laughs> Somebody's going to die. I'm just saying. Because she's jealous. Jeff, she's jealous. My man, I tell you. Jealous. Oh, she looks nice. <clears throat> she mean. I'm You're laughing. But the Bible says the Lord our God is a jealous God. He don't want you smooching the world. You come up in here with lipstick on your collar from the world. You get the metaphor. You still got Saturday night boogaloo on you? Trying to bust a praise? Yeah. You wonder why God resists. I'll tell you why God resists. If I have one more person tell me, but I live under grace. I can, I'm saved and I can live how I want to live and God doesn't judge me. You hear me, Paul. I think he has more credentials than most of you. Paul says that we should not use grace or our liberty thereof for an occasion of the flesh. Jesus didn't die on the cross so you can live in the pig pen. He died on the cross so you can live in the palace and be with him. Amen. Jesus is coming for a church that is not soiled by the world. He's looking for a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. We can argue about where the line is. And some preachers have carried it too far. But there's got to be a line somewhere between here and the world. Here it is. I wonder if Aiken's wife and kids would say, Daddy, Daddy, what have you done? I wonder what the wives of the 36 men who didn't have to die would say, what was my husband's life worth? A few garments and some precious metals? I wonder what you're going to allow to take your life. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? Too many are trading their soul for the things of this world. Second Peter, very clearly, when you get home, Looking at the whole chapter of 2 Peter, talking to church people. I'm in the church. This shouldn't be for me. He's talking to church people. He says, you need to know not to put your confidence in the things of the world, for the world is already perishing and the desires thereof. The, the world is already dying. It just don't know it yet. This world is coming unraveled. And the more chaotic and unraveled it becomes, it identifies that God is coming. Coming back for those who are looking for his glorious appearing. I don't know about you, but if I knew you were coming to my house, I'd be dressed appropriately. The house would be clean. The door would be open and some food would be cooked. Amen. I had the privilege this week of getting to visit with Joe Shelton. I love Joe. He's still fighting some health issues. You pray for him. He said, well, you haven't been by the house in a while. I said, Joe, my southern raisin dictates that I bring something with me. And since you've gotten to be such a severe diabetic, I don't know how I can come and not bring something. I don't know what to bring. I'm used to bringing something. It's in my nature. If somebody's coming to your house, you invited them, you'd have the door open, right? But do, do, do we live a life? That says, I'm looking for him. I'm expecting him to knock on my, it, it, it's my abode, my temporary home. See, your body is just temporary. When you realize this world's temporary, that this, ba- this building won't matter in 100 years. You're so focused on your health, but in 100 years your health won't matter. It's liberating to realize. Let me read for you two verses and we're going to pray. James chapter 4 says in verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not 
that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Do you not think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth and envy? That is not of God. The Word is telling us here, James speaking clearly to the church. We got to be careful not to let worldly thinking creep into our minds and become acceptable. Remember, worldliness is when righteousness looks strange and sin looks normal. I'm going to ask you today you're saying, Preacher, how are you going to give an altar call with a sermon like that? I'm not, but the Spirit is drawing people today. The Spirit was speaking to hearts as I was talking, and you knew that what was being said fit perfectly in that question mark of your heart. Today, God has not set you up to fail. He has set you up to succeed. He's got one simple request. Obey me, and you will be blessed. Obey me, and I can fulfill the promises. Today, if you are weary and well-doing, if today you are conflicted and there's a war in your heart between what you should do, what you want to do, but Mama said... It's not what mama said. It's not what grandmama said. What does the word say? Is my life lining up to the word of God? Or if I allowed the devil to steal, kill, and destroy the promises of God in my life? I want you to stand today. Something a little different for us. The altar today we call this front area the altar. It's, it's where you take a step of faith and move out. And you come up front and you're indicating you want to pray and you, you want to let go of some things and you want to allow God to move on you and in you. Some of you today have very serious health issues. Today when we open these altars, I don't want just people that are reflecting on this word today, but those that this week have been evaluating those this week who have had struggles. Those this week who have been limping spiritually. Can I say to you today, some want to teach that there is a thing called carnal Christianity. There is not a carnal Christian. That's like saying a heavenly demon. No way. Today, if you want to ask God to give you the power for living an obedient lifestyle. Sister Beth's going to sing this chorus. And I want you by faith. Not, I want you by faith to say, God, if there be anything in me, God, I, I want to be right with you. And I know you're coming back. And I, and I want to be ready. And today is that day for me. As she sings, I want you today to come to this altar and cry out to God.